giving us offering and sure to be used in the building of God's kingdom. I'm trying to read the uh, Psalms 95. I, I'm not a very good speaker, uh, so uh, you know, bear with me. So I kind of get nervous and heart fluttering and different things. But I just don't, don't get good in front of people. So. Uh, Turn to uh, Psalms 95. Uh, it says, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. So let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. And that's what he wants us to do. He wants us to make a joyful noise, and he wants us to give him praise and glory and honor. Verse 3 says, For the Lord is a great God, and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of, his, of the hills is his also. The sea is his, the sea is his, and he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. And that's another thing he wants us to do. He wants us to bow down and give him the glory and honor. <coughs> That he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Verse 7 says, For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if ye will hear his voice, it says, Harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, and as in the day of the temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation. And said, It is a people that do err in their heart, and they, and they know not my ways. And to whom I, shall, I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. There's a way to escape that, that we can, by not entering into his rest, is that, that is by accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And that's what he wants us to do. He says, If you hear his voice, harden not your heart. He's pleading in the calling for you to accept him as your Savior. Thanks for the hand brings message. Praise the Lord. I excuse me. This happens so often. And I've never seen it happen any more directly than this. The message today was taken from Hebrews three and four. And it quotes over and over and over again from Psalms chapter 93, 95 rather, the one that Paul just read to you. We hadn't spoken about this prior to today. I, I want to just to give you an idea of what Hebrews is about. And I, I've struggled in the book of Hebrews myself. I've, I've read through it. We had, several years ago, we had a Bible study on Thursday nights where we went clear through it, and I still, it was a difficult book for me. But I think in my study, in the last 24 hours, I've gotten more out of Hebrews than I ever had before. And now, I mean, the Lord, if I would have picked out something for somebody else to read, that, that was actually... A psalm that I was going to ask you to read at home because it, it's quoted so often. Uh, I want to read a little bit, and I'll go through this fairly quick in 2 Corinthians 3 to start with. And, and this helps me to kind of see what we need to really remember as we read through Hebrews. Uh, beginning with verse 2, 2 Corinthians 3, Paul writing to the church at Corinth, he says, Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of iron. There's a difference between Old Testament times and, and the New Testament. And that's, that's really what the whole idea of Hebrews is. It's, it's to follow Jesus Christ and, and the New Testament, to follow Him, rather than to continue in the old ways. But this, this chapter right here tells us how great and wonderful those old ways were also. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward. 
Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. The Old Testament you had to follow by the letter. You had to do what it said and do the commandments therein. In the New Testament, we follow the Spirit. We don't want to steal from somebody else. We don't want to lie. We don't want to do all the things that the Old Testament tells us that we shouldn't do. In the Old Testament, you just did it by the letter. You know, you didn't lie because we were told not to lie. Not because you didn't want to. You didn't steal from people because you don't want to in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, you didn't steal because you were told not to. In the New Testament, we are to be holy, righteous individuals because we want to. Not because it was commanded. And it was commanded in the book of Leviticus that they were to be holy. It was a commandment. But if the manifestation of death, written and engraved in stones, was glorious, speaking of, directly of the Ten Commandments here, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. Moses was up on the mount for 40 days. And when he came down, his face glowed. It shined so much that people couldn't look directly at him. That's how glorious and wonderful the Old Testament was. Verse 8 says, How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelled. The Old Testament law that Moses led, that he told everybody about, that he was the leader of, was temporary. But the law of Christ, the New Testament, is eternal. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. In Romans 14, the Old Testament is still valuable for us today. It is still glorious. We're not under the Old Testament. We don't do, uh, we do, but we do it because we want to, really, because the New Testament carries over the Old Testament. But it's a, it's a desire within us to, to live our lives right. In uh, Romans 14, verse 4, it says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. And as we read through the book of Hebrews, I think it's important to remember that it's a comparison of Jesus Christ and Moses. And those that followed Moses, the nation of Israel, and those that followed Jesus Christ, the Christian. Chapter 3 in Hebrews. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ. We're told here by the writer of Hebrews to consider Jesus Christ. And notice it's written to the holy brethren. In, in Leviticus chapter 11, and I've already mentioned this, they were told, they were commanded to be holy brethren in Old Testament times too. But it was a command. And here, the writer of Hebrews is speaking to the Christians. Verse 2, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. So Jesus Christ, we know, was faithful. He came into this earth. He lived a life as a man. He was tempted like we're tempted, yet without sin. And he was obedient even to his death on the cross. It says Moses was also faithful in his house. Moses did what God wanted him to do. Moses gave the law to the house of Israel. Moses led the Jewish nation out of Egypt. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Speaking of Jesus Christ, he's, 
He's worthy of even more than what Moses was. And as I read in 2 Corinthians, Moses, the law was so glorious that Moses' face shined. It was that important. Inasmuch as he who hath built of the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that buildeth all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. Moses was as a hireling is for the sheep. Jesus Christ is the great, great shepherd of his house. Moses was a faithful servant to God as he led the house of Israel, the Jewish nation. He was a faithful servant. Jesus Christ said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus Christ built his church, of which he is the leader, the great high priest, of which he is the head. But Christ as a son over his house, whose house are we? The house of Christ, the church, is us. If we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. But he that endureth to the end the same shall be saved. He that endureth unto death shall receive a crown of righteousness. We need to endure. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if ye will hear my voice, and this is from Psalms 95, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Now when Paul read that, we had no idea. I mean, it was written by David. So were these the words of David? It could have been. But here it's explained to us that this is the Holy Ghost that said this. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. During that time, they, they, they were led out of Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea on dry land. And shortly thereafter, they had forgotten all about God. When Moses went up to receive the Ten Commandments, 40 days, one month and 10 days, was all he was gone. And during that time, they built a golden calf to worship. They turned away from God that quick. Their hearts became hardened to what they had seen, what they had witnessed. There's nobody here can even imagine how what a thing it would be. I mean, we've seen movies that try to, to show what it's like to part the Red Sea. And to, and to walk through on dry ground. It wasn't muddy like some of the movies show us where they get their carts stuck in the mud and everything. It wasn't muddy. It was dry ground. That's what the scriptures tell us. And shortly after that, they turned to a, a guy that was made of gold. Just a calf, or bronze, whatever it was, gold. Was made. How easy it is to turn away from the Lord if we let our hearts be hardened. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways. They continued to do this over and over. If you, if you go back and read about the wandering in the wilderness over and over, they're ready to curse God and head back to Egypt where things were very difficult for them. So I swear in my wrath, and this is still the Holy Spirit, so I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. And you can read in Numbers 14 that they did not enter into that rest. Actually, I'll read a couple of verses for you there. Numbers 14, 30 and 31. You know, we often say the only ones that entered into the rest, which was the land of Canaan, was Caleb and Joshua. Verse 30 in Numbers 14 says, Doubtless ye shall not come into the land. This is because they had turned away from the Lord, and they weren't doing what the Lord wanted them to. 
concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Look at the next verse. But your little ones, which he said should be a prey, them will I bring in, and they shall know the land which he had despised. It wasn't just Caleb and Joshua. They were the ones over 20. But the little ones would also enter in. So the promise was still there to enter into his rest. Hebrews 3 verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. We're told in chapter 10 of Hebrews, not forsaking the assembly of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Exhorting one another. We need to continue to lift each other up, to, to help each other as much as we can. And here it says, while it is called today, we're to do this daily. You know, in, in, in chapter 10, it talks about not forsaking the assembly, which we don't want to do. We want to come into the, the church house on the first day of the week as we assemble together. That's very important, even for the fellowship and for our opportunity to exhort one another. But here it says we need to do it daily. Who do you hang with during the week? Christians? You know, our work situation doesn't always allow us to be with Christians every day. We should make it a point to be with Christians. If we're living in a situation where we're out with the world for six days, you know, certainly we need to, to study God's Word. Certainly we need to continue to follow God's Word and, and to, to learn more about it. But we need to be with our brothers and sisters in Christ too. We need to be able to spend time with them on a daily basis, as it says right here. Verse 14, For ye are made partakers of Christ, if ye hold the beginning of your confidence steadfast unto the end. Again, the beginning of our confidence, when we're baptized into Jesus Christ, when we give our life to Christ and start living for Him, that's the beginning of our confidence. But we need to hold that steadfastly unto the end. While it is said, today, if ye will hear my voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. Again, don't harden your hearts like they did in the wilderness as they wandered through the wilderness and they kept turning away from God. They wouldn't see what God was doing for them. They had eyes. They had ears, but they wouldn't hear the Lord. They wanted to do things their way. There is a way that seemeth right unto man. But the end are our are the ways of death. We need to do what the Lord tells us to. We need to follow Him and not, not try to improve on it, not try to do it the way we think it is best, but to do what God says. Verse 16, For some, when they had heard, did provoke. Howbeit not all are come, not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? All those that were over twenty died in the wilderness. They wouldn't follow the Lord. They wouldn't listen. They wouldn't see. And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not? It was those that didn't have the faith, those that didn't really trust God, those who actually saw some of the one, most wonderful miracles ever performed and just didn't pay any attention to it. They still thought their way was best. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Unbelief is going to keep people out of heaven. In... Uh, Matthew 13, Jesus was, was in his hometown of Jerusalem. And he tried to speak to the people there. He, he apparently had done some miracles. 
but it said he didn't do very many miracles because of their unbelief. Jesus went someplace where they would see, where they would hear. In uh, Luke 17, the apostles, these are the apostles of Jesus Christ. And this was after being in the ministry and following Jesus for nearly three years. They said, increase our faith. We're told that faith is a grain of mustard seed. You know, if we had that much faith, we could move a mountain. We could pluck up a tree and have it move someplace else. With just that tiny little bit of faith. We need to pray regularly to increase our faith. Help us, Lord, to believe, to really be strong in our beliefs. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, and any of you should seem to come short of it. There were those in the wilderness that did not enter into the rest that was promised them, the land of Canaan. They didn't enter in because of their unbelief. We have a rest also. We need to truly believe. We need to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and be obedient to his word. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. And God did rest the seventh day from all his works. So there's a rest. God rested the seventh day after working for six days. The people of Israel had a rest in the land of Canaan. And many missed out on that rest because they didn't believe. Because they wouldn't accept Jesus Christ or God. They wouldn't believe God. They wouldn't follow him and do the things he said. They weren't following the law the way they were supposed to. They kept turning away from the Lord. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. They didn't enter into the land of Canaan. Again, he limited a certain day, saying to David, Today, after so long a time as it is said, Today, if ye will hear my voice, harden not your hearts. Again, from Psalms 95. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. This can be confusing. There's a Hebrew word for Jesus, a Hebrew name for Jesus, Joshua the same name as the name Jesus. Joshua is the one that actually led the people of Israel into the land of Canaan. It was Joshua that did this. But even at that time, there was another rest that was spoken of. And that is the one that Jesus will lead us into. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. This is speaking of our eternal rest, the rest of heaven that we have promised to us, but we need to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness for this to be added unto us. For he that is entered into his rest, that being God, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into the rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. You know, people talk about works, and they can talk about works all they want. Did God rest for six days and then enter into his rest? No. We don't rest from our resting, do we? We rest from our works. God worked for six days, and then he had a rest. The people in the... Israelites that were in Egypt. They had some difficult times to go through, but God was there and helped them. But they didn't listen. And they didn't enter into their rest. Today, we need to be obedient to God's word. 
We need to seek him first. We need to put him above everything else that there is in this life. We need to love Jesus more than we love our own parents and our own families. That's what Jesus tells us. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful. Quick means it's alive. And it's powerful or, or active. The word of God is quick. It's powerful. It's alive. It's active. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword. You know, a two-edged sword is, is, is made of a, a special metal because it needs to be so sharp. But the word of God is even sharper. Look what the word of God can do. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. You know, we can study God's Word and we can see that there's a difference between the soul and the spirit. But you can't just go to one verse and say there's the difference. They are so closely related that it's difficult for us to discern the difference between the soul and the spirit. And I'm not going to try to do it right now. That's another whole sermon or two. But they're that closely related. And it also, and of the joints and marrow. The marrow within our bones is within those joints. It's that closely related, but the Word of God can separate the two. And this one said it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God knows the difference between what we're thinking and what we actually intend. We can't tell the difference sometimes. We're thinking something, and that's what we think, but... You know, in our subconscious, we're maybe intending something different. But the Word of God can separate the two. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. God knows all. Verse 13 says basically the same thing. There is, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. God knows every creature and everything about it. He knows the number of hairs on our heads. He knows the number of the stars in the sky and he's given all them a name. God is an awesome God. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Let us continue. Once we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, let us continue to live for Jesus Christ. Let us continue to be witnesses for him that others might come to him. Let us continue to live as Christians so that people can see Jesus Christ living in us. We're the light of the world. That's what he's got. It's his light shining through us. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus Christ became a man. And I've heard it said he was 50% God and 50% man. He was 100% God and 100% man. He had all the fleshly parts that we have. He had all the feelings, all the temptations that we go through. Felt pain the same way we do. Yet he was without sin. And this is our great high priest. He entered into heaven once for everybody. The high priest in Old Testament times would enter into the holiest of holies once a year to give a sacrifice to show a, a pushing forward of his sins is all it did. But Jesus Christ entered once for everybody. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. How do we do that? How do we come boldly into the throne of grace? where Jesus Christ is, on the throne of God. We do that through prayer. We ask God. He knows the things we have need of, but he asks us to, to make those requests known to him. And it says, when we come to him in prayer, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When we pray to the Lord, he'll answer our prayers. And it may not be exactly what we want or what we think we want, 
because he knows the difference between our thoughts and our intentions. We may ask for something and he may have something better for us. We may not even see it as something better at the time, but God knows our hearts better than we do. God will give us what we need at a given time. We ask and we see. And he gives it to us. That, you know, if we had a child, and the scriptures tell us, Jesus tells us, if we ask, if, if our children would come to us and ask for a rock because they were hungry, that's not what we're going to give them. We'll give them bread. That's why I say sometimes we don't really know what we need as well as God does. He knows us better than we know ourselves. As Christians, we're told not to harden our hearts. We need to continue to listen to the Word of God. We need to continue to see Him living in other Christians. We can look at nature and see God in every single thing out there. We're told that in, in Romans chapter 1, that, that people should know there's a God just by looking around them. We should know that. That there is a God, the supreme being, the creator of everything. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you know it says that the Spirit will draw you. And if that Spirit used to draw you, and He's not drawing you anymore, pray that He that He starts drawing you again. People are sometimes under conviction and they work so hard to avoid it that the Spirit quits. You need to pray that that spirit returns. That you start feeling that same thing that you felt before, that God wants you in his family. That God wants you to be a part of eternal life in heaven. I pray that your hearts have not been hardened to the place that the Holy Spirit will never come back. Because I don't think, I don't think he ever totally gives up while we're in this life. But we're told now is the time of salvation. When that Holy Spirit works on you, you need to give your life to Christ. Give it up. Start living for Jesus Christ. It, it's so wonderful to live for Him. And it is, it is, it is so rough to just keep trying to put Him off all the time. I've been there. That's how I know. Give your life to Jesus Christ if you're not a Christian. Now is the day of salvation. This uh, closing song, number 632, is still fairly new for us. Hebrews 3, 7, and 8 says, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Let us stand and sing our song. Of